All right, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord here again. Father, thank you that your word is, is powerful, that it's alive and sharp, and that you send it to do work, to help us understand, to correct us, to encourage us, to nourish us. Thank you, Lord, that we are not left alone to figure this out on our own. And so, Father, may you do that right now. May you just help us to really focus on the word you have for us today, for your glory for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been asking the Lord the last how many weeks, probably eight weeks, to help reorient our lives, our minds, our hearts, our behaviors to his kingdom, to his plan, to his life, right? Why? Because it's really easy for all of us here today and to just be oriented through other things, to be disoriented then by the craziness of our society, by the desires of our own narcissism, right? We need the Spirit of God to help redirect us, to reorient us. And so we welcome this. This is a good thing. It's a good thing, even if sometimes it steps on our toes. We've been going through these famous letters, letters written to real churches in the first century in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. We've gone through a number of them already, uh, dealing with issues, issues that maybe on the surface are kind of like, ah, okay. Uh, maybe, Maybe they're not so obvious, but as we have seen, as we, we, as we are peeling back the layers, as we dig into them, we, we are dealing with real issues here that are plaguing these churches and very important to deal with. But as we've also seen then that these issues and these problems are not isolated, they're not merely archaic, they're not things for us to sort of stick our noses up saying, well, we're far more informed today. You know, we don't struggle with those things. You know, these issues that they were dealing with are human issues. They're issues that I deal with, that you deal with, Right? dangers that we can fall into, disorientations that we can buy that get us off course. So as we approach our fourth letter today, let's go in with an open heart, open mind to see what Jesus said to this church in Thyatira. The verses are from chapter 2 of Revelation, beginning at verse 18, and then going to the end of that chapter. Revelation 2, 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, your love, your faith, and your service, patient endurance, and that your latter works exceeded the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold... I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into the great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who only do not, who have learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay any of you any burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and when eaten pots are broken in pieces, then I myself have received an authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, simple structure again, it's kind of similar to last week and the week before. Uh, these letters all have similar structures. They, sometimes they have praises, sometimes they don't. There's usually a problem, and there's always promises. So this is kind of our, our focus here, and we're going to look at a, a lesson today as well. Well, Thyatira, as we've looked at all these cities here, you can kind of see where it's placed in. It's far more inland than some of the other ones. It's the smallest of the seven cities. We really don't know how big the church was. Probably not very big. There's nothing particularly amazing about this town. There's no grand library or all these things, the things that we've talked about with these other cities. The city was an ancient city, though, which until it had come under the control by Rome, was seemingly always in the middle of a territorial fight because it sat right along a trade route. So that's kind of a significant thing. And that trade route really then shapes the uniqueness of the city and this letter as well. Thyatira was an important manufacturing city, right? We think of all the different cities in America. You know, every city, you know, Ephesus, we could say maybe that was New York City or something like that, right? Uh, Last week uh, with Pergamum, maybe that was like D.C., the political center. Uh, Thyatira is probably like Detroit, Manufacturing, 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 taking advantage of that trade route. Among the ancient ruins of the city, we find all these inscriptions related to all these guilds, 
of cloth dyers in the city. We'll come back to that in a few moments, but basically a guild is like a union, it's like a society, it's like a club. Uh, there are more guilds in Thyatira than any other city in that area, okay? So there's inscriptions to wool workers, linen workers, uh, makers of outer garments, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, and bronze smiths. I mean, people worked in this city. It was manufacturing. It was a mecca. And that's really significant, as we'll, we'll see in a moment. Well, let's look at the text here. Verse 19 starts with the praise. And Jesus says, I know your works, your love, and your faith, and your service, and patient endurance. Strong praise. Pretty self-explanatory, honestly. He sees their works. It's a fruit of this faith. How does that show up? Well, he, he names it here, love, right? Christ sees this church in Thyatira filled with the love of God, with the love of man for one another. It is loving, it is caring, it is a fellowship and community. It's beautiful. He sees their faith. This is a church with faith. They, they are trusting in Christ, trusting the Lord, devoted to him, believing the Lord to be true, which motivates everything they're doing, right? They're a church of service, active, involved in church, community, whatever that would have looked like at the time. Right? They, they would meet needs. And they, had a, they were a church of patient endurance. He sees their perseverance. They're going to stay the course, hold the faith, resolved even in the hard times that we've talked about that have plagued all this first century life. So check this out, though. What does it say at the end? Your latter works exceeded the first. That's really significant. They hadn't lost or given up. They hadn't walked away from their first love, kind of like Ephesus. The deeds were growing they're in there, it's flowing out of their faith. It was a beautiful package. They were progressing. They were maturing in their spirituality. This was not a dead church. It was not a standstill church. It was not simply existing, going through the motions. They were growing, right? They were learning. They were developing. And this church receives strong praise. The Spirit of God is working here. The fruit is growing in sanctification. If you and I, if we were to step through the doors of this church in Thyatira, we probably would have been pretty impressed. No doubt we would have seen and experienced a congregation that just knows how to show hospitality. We would have seen, wow, this church is actually doing stuff. They're, they're, they're helping people to live for Jesus. They're serious about their faith. They're, they're filled with people that are showing compassion and showing love and concern. Honestly, we would have probably all walked away saying, wow. What a great church. Highly attractive, highly attractive. So what Christ is saying here is pretty amazing. It's, it's what every person, honestly, it's what every church would want to be. A church commended by Christ to be full of good works and love, right? And service and generosity and, and endurance. <laughs> I wish the letter would have stopped there, right? It doesn't. Despite all these wonderful things happening, there is an evil that is lurking, <laughs> There's a problem here. <clears throat> Verse 20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. There's a problem here, and the problem is the toleration of Jezebel and her teaching. Now, now who is this Jezebel in Thyatira? We're not really sure. There's a lot of speculation, but it sure seems as though it's, it's pointing to a specific person, Okay? Don't get lost in it too much. It's, it, we, we don't want to get lost in it. What's important, though, is that what this person says. This person calls herself a prophetess, okay? She is a self-proclaimed prophet. Claiming then, what does that mean? Claiming a direct line saying like, well, God told me stuff. God told me this. God told me that. And with that platform, then what is she doing? She is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So we have a false teacher on one who claims to speak for God, and then we have the toleration of her. Now, scholars doubt her name was actually Jezebel, but the name Jezebel that is being attributed to her is not an accident. We gotta go back to the Old Testament to find out why. First Kings. We go back into the history here. And in this period of time, Ahab is the king. Now, I think it's safe to say Ahab, Ahab was not an amazing spiritual leader for the Lord. Right? And the condition of Israel at this time is not awesome. Jezebel, the pagan daughter of a pagan king. And so why would Ahab marry a pagan daughter of a pagan king? This is kind of relevant, actually. You see, Ahab wanted Israel's borders to be safe, and he wanted to be prosperous. 
And so he makes a treaty with Phoenicia, which is the northwestern border, a military treaty, a commercial treaty, and he seals that with the marriage to Jezebel. And in marrying Jezebel, Ahab, then one could say, completely compromised the religious heart of Israel, simply for security and for prosperity. And this allowed Jezebel to get in, influence the faith of the nation, and she introduced Baal worship after she marries Ahab. And and we have this mixing, this syncretism, this mixing of the faith. And then with it, then, the justification for idolatry and immorality. And as a result of the syncretism, again, you can go back and read this on your own, we have a ton of prophets getting killed. She tried to kill Elijah, remember that? And she urged her her husband Ahab all along. And what does the Bible say? What does God say about Ahab? He did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than anyone before him. So Jezebel, her influence was a seductive form of evil, not only allowing for idolatry and allowing for adultery, but justifying it. And the result is a great evil was introduced into the land, and Ahab did evil, right? Right? So back to Thyatira here again. So Jesus is saying, you've allowed this self-proclaimed prophetess, this Jezebel, into your community. So let's connect some dots here, okay? I mentioned Thyatira was this great commercial city. And there's all these guilds, these unions. And in, the, in a guild, again, is like this workers' union. And within this workers' union, you had, you had training, you had an apprenticeship, you had licensing, you had an enforcement of standards, you had advertising. Anything related to the business world was connected into these guilds. And all of these manufacturing aspects had its own guild. So again, wool workers, linen workers, you know, tanners, potters, bakers, bronze smiths. It was a massive industrial center. Guilds were everywhere. Sounds good, right? Except <laughs> guild membership meant something, right? Guild feasts. Every, every guild was tied to different aspects of paganism. And guild feasts were ded- dedicated to these pagan gods when all these people would get together and throw parties. And there was sexual morality everywhere, pagan worship everywhere. And as a member of a guild, you were expected to join in and participate in it. It was a club. It's how life worked. It was just assumed behavior. Now, this would have been a particular problem for a Christ follower, right? Hey, who, who has a business, who has a trade, and you're like, okay, if I, if I want to sell my product, I, well, then I kind of have to join these unions or these guilds. I want to have money, right? I need to survive. And anyone outside of these unions struggled terribly. It was economic suicide if you didn't. And history reveals there are some Christians who didn't. They remained faithful, and yet they were poor. Okay? So you have that situation. Along comes the convenient teachings of Jezebel, who is claiming to speak for God. Hey, I got something for you. Hear this secret message. And you can imagine this woman, Jezebel, she's probably beautiful. She's probably well-dressed, probably well-spoken. She probably had a powerful personality. She probably was very persuasive with her speech. No doubt, she was probably super quick on her feet. She was probably clever. And she was probably had a, a biting scorn for her critics. And she's got this amazing trump card. What is it? Oh, by the way, I speak for God. <laughs> I speak for God. And she's saying, hey, guys, don't worry about all this stuff. Don't worry about this guild behavioral stuff. You got to do what you got to do to survive. I mean, after all, business is just business. And if you know, if your business practices collided with your faith, don't worry about it. You got to make a living after all. After all, this is the society we live in. God understands a little bit here, a little bit there. No, no big deal. You just got to do what you got to do to get through Monday through Friday to succeed. But make sure you're here on Sunday because you got to still follow Jesus, right? Make sure you're still singing that choir. Make sure you still give, but hey, you can have it all. You can have Jesus and heaven and salvation and idols and guilt-free sexuality. You can have it all. God would never want you to be poor. God would never want you to be ostracized from society. And by the way, thus says the Lord, aren't you glad that I'm here to help you understand the secret things of God? Aren't you glad that God sent me to help you navigate through these hard things in life? This would have been crazy powerful. It would have played on every heartstring imaginable, every practical reality. This would have been easy. It would have been popular. A little bit of compromise here and there for economic and physical security. I mean, I got to raise my family, right? This is socially acceptable. 
And some people were listening to her. They were tolerating her, but then some people were actually listening to her and going headlong into immorality. Others did not, though, but they tolerated her. They didn't want to cause a rift. After all, we got to be loving, right? Perhaps they tried. Maybe they got yelled at. We don't know. What's clear here, though, friends, is that theological compromise for societal acceptance is what is happening. So despite the wonderful praise within this church, <laughs> there's a problem. And he continues, I gave her, that's Jezebel, time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I'll throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I'll throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. I'll strike your children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart, and I'll give to each of you as your works declare. I want you to see a couple things here. Notice, for Jezebel, there's not a call to repentance. Okay? That's past. He said, I gave her time. Let that sink in. God's had enough. He gave her time over and over and over, evidently, and she rejected it. And his people are being led astray by this false prophet. She is ruining them, and he has had enough. And so we have a straight announcement of judgment to Jezebel. It's over. It's kind of scary, isn't it? But notice also, though, for the believers that are compromised that are following her, there's actually a nugget of grace. And it says here, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tri tribulation unless. You see that? That's the hook. Unless. There's an opportunity of, of grace. There's an opportunity of repentance. God is giving them this opportunity, right? Repent. Confess your sin. But if they persist, if they keep going in this syncretism, in this rebellion, Jesus proceeds with a very strong word of judgment on her and all of her followers. Two reasons. All churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I'll give to each of you as your works deserve. He is going to make an example out of these people. He's reminding his church, and not this, this church, every church, and us. I see everything. I have the eyes of fire, right? I know all. I know exactly what's going on. You can't pull a fast one on me. And the intro, intro of the letter started that way, right? The eyes of fire, seeing with clarity, seeing, though, with the result of judgment. And these things, the sin, these evil, the compromise, the rebellion, the rejection of me, it's not going to go unpunished. That's what he's saying. But hear this promise. To the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, only hold fast what you have until I come. What an important verse. The rest of you. The rest of you. Many are there that are not holding on to these teachings. They're probably struggling financially. They're probably not in the in crowd at church even. That's encouraging, isn't it? In the midst of all the yuck and all the compromise, the temptations to compromise, the false teachings of the heretic who probably had a pretty strong platform, many are faithful. They're, they're planted in the word. And the call, hold fast, grip tight into that love and faith and service and perseverance into Christ, right? And the one who conquers his promise, who keeps my words until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. And when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I'll give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So to the one who overcomes this life, again, to hold fast, right? The promise. And like every one of these letters up to this point has been similar. The promise is good news. And, and, and there's a lot of illustration, uh, imagery here. Again, in all these letters, there's so much imagery. And, and there are things, some of them, that defy description or even adequate explanation. Uh, what, what we can see is that all these letters, though, end with these promises surrounding on in eternal life. Perfection with Christ. So what a beautiful truth that Christ is giving with these people. Despite the hardships, despite no, no doubt their economic poverty, right? He's saying, hold fast. Lift up the eyes of your heart to me, to my promises. Not on what's happening around you. Stay with me. This is what awaits you. This is what awaits you. I await you. A great promise. <clears throat> So, okay, we've gone through the letter here. Just, again, we can do a lot more, but just to kind of get a handle on what, what is happening. How is this relevant for us today? Now, <laughs> I have about eight lessons here. I'm not going to give you them all, but here's a couple lists. Here, here's the thing. There's a lot here that we could dive into, 
right? We, we could talk about the temptations to compromise in life. Uh, we, we could talk about what does radical following of Christ look like? Again, the people here said no to the guilds, knowing that by saying no, that was radical, and they are going to live a life of poverty. Uh, we could talk about the relationship between love and truth, right, and how those actually work together. You can actually love people and not tolerate the behavior, right? We could talk about the differences between our struggling with sin and our direct causing of someone else to sin. That God kind of takes that very seriously. We could talk about how serious the Lord takes sin in general and how, how our loving God is a God who hates sin and will not allow it to win. We could talk about that. We could talk about the promises of eternal life. I mean, there's a lot of things here, right? Maybe just even just giving you the cliff note statements will just let your mind and heart marinate on them throughout the day and maybe throughout the week. There's a lot there now that you know what's happening in Thyatira. But I want to hunker down on one lesson today, one lesson. And that's really all over this text. And I think one that has plagued humanity since the beginning, okay? It's this. The written scriptures are God's word and as such our final authority for faith and life. And you're like, what? How'd you get there? <laughs> How'd you get there? In Thyatira, so much of the problem, if not the majority of the problem, stemmed from what? They were listening to a self appointed prophet claiming to speak the words of God. That's how I got there. Now, in the book of Revelation, we talked about how it was written probably in the 90s AD, roughly, if we'll go with that date. And so it's the last book in the New Testament. By this time, friends, uh, there's a lot of letters in the New Testament being copied and spread and read all around. If you read the Didache, right, which some people say is early as 70 AD, maybe as early as 50 AD, it references up to 10 books already. The Clement of Rome in 95 AD, he writes on, and things like that, and, and he references up to 14 books. Peter, even in the book of 2 Peter 3, references the letters of Paul that are hard to understand, implying that people are already reading them. All right? The point I'm making is that the apostolic writings, the scriptures, they were in circulation. People were receiving them as authoritative. They were receiving them as the word of God already in the first century. It's not like they had to wait 400 years to figure out, well, what's God's word? No, that's a lie. Believers recognized the apostles, and they recognized that their work was qualitatively different. It was inspired by the Lord. And so if that's the case, why is this church falling prey to some Jezebel saying, hey, guys, listen to me, I speak for God? Why is that happening? Here's the deal. None of this is new. Mankind has suffered from this since the outset of creation. Mankind is always seeking a word, a greater word above the word of God, believing that God's word is not enough. That just really comes naturally to all of us. I mean, go back to the Garden of Eden. Let's just run through history here. Did God really say, hey, Eve, I got a better word for you. I got secret knowledge for you. And she's like, ooh, Right? Old Testament, there's tons of prof false prophets everywhere, despite the constant warning. And people are like, ooh, something more. The whole arc of the history of Israel is chock full of authoritative innovation. <laughs> I mean, there's just the major false additions over time. Hundreds of new laws that the religious elite created. And then conveniently determined that these additions were authoritative. And then convinced the common folk that they are necessary and authoritative and binding. And the people are like, oh, okay. <laughs> we kind of see how that played out with Jesus, right? Yeah, he wasn't a fan. We see the rise of false prophets and heretics in the early church. We see the exact same issue that develops within Israel's history, within church history. And we see these accretions, these additions of teachings developing, especially rampant post-6th century and it was crazy. In 787, one council says, it is okay to venerate icons. Just a couple years later in 794, an entirely different council says, no, 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 it's not. And both are claiming to say, this is God's word. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? We see throughout church history the authority, the authority wielded by the church devising new teachings and claiming ultimate authority, which ironically serves pretty well to consolidate their power. And people are like, oh, oh. All right, something more. 
It is not hard for us to see this in history. It is so easy to spiritualize this. Many do. It's just there. We see it today, though, friends. All over the church world today, people are claiming to be prophets. People are saying, well, God told me this. God told me this. God told me this. People are publishing books. Well, God told me this, so let me tell you this. I got some secret knowledge for you. And there's conferences after conferences after conferences pushing some kind of new revelation, pushing some kind of secret knowledge, pushing some sort of teaching, all with the caveat, yeah, I, God's, God told me this. And if God told me this, um, well, then... You probably should listen. And people are like, ooh, ooh, something more. All of this, Old Testament, through the New Testament, throughout today, it is no different than the teaching of Jezebel, claiming authority from God, claiming some hidden idea, claiming some revelation. Revolution, revelation, there we go. (laughs) Friends, you and I, mankind, we are so good at usurping the authority of the word of God. And hear this, friends, you gotta hear this. The result is always, always spiritual manipulation. Spiritual manipulation. And mankind goes blindly after it because our nature, deep down in our hearts, our sinful hearts, we we think, well, God's word, it's not enough. We crave innovation. We crave something new. And then we we get it and we find ways to justify it. We find ways to spiritualize it. It is spiritual manipulation. And that results in all sorts of ugly. It results in theological compromise. It results in idolatry. It It results in confusion of the gospel. It results in the elevation of man, right? Which is always going to result in spiritual frustration. Friends, it results in sin. Now, if you haven't made the connection yet... Today is Reformation Sunday. Let me connect a dot for you, okay? The issue of authority stands strong. And in the time of the Reformation, authority was the dominant issue. Is the word of God enough? Or do do I need something more? Do I need more people? Do I need more councils? Do I need a certain church structure that have often contradicted one another throughout history and have often continually innovated things. Do I, do I need all that, or is the word of God enough? Luther was like, hey, guys, hey, guys, I got something for you. I want to talk to you. Let's have a conversation. The church, man, the church is teaching so many things that are right, this creedal faith. I love all that. That's good. But can we talk about some of these innovations that have sort of crept in over the last 1,000 years? Can, can we just say, like, where, where, where are they in the Bible? Can we just sort of have a conversation about those things? Where, where do we see that in the first couple hundred years of the church? Do we see these innovations? And that started the whole thing. Isn't it safer just to stick to the word <laughs> instead of rely on religious politicians that seem eager to consolidate power? The lesson today in the heart of the Reformation, I think, it's, it's a hard thing. It's a never-ending issue, and it constantly is hitting us in our hearts. But letting the written scriptures stand as God's authoritative and final word, friends, it's wise. It's wise. I'm going to give you three reasons here. Let me go quick, all right? Three reasons why this statement we should let stand. Number one, it's a faith issue. It's a faith issue. Faith stands on the identity of God. We are, we are, we are thinking, okay, who's the one who's given us this word? If God is God, what does that mean? It means that he is the creator, the eternal, the omnipotent, powerful king. And if he is perfect and if he is true, what does that mean? It also means that he has given us something that represents that, that flows from that. And the word speaks about that. Check this out from 2 Peter. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they carried along by the Holy Spirit. Faith takes this. Faith receives this. It trusts in this because it trusts in the identity of the one who sent it. We believe that the Holy Spirit guided the words being used, employing the writer's personality, the writer's styles, the writer's experiences. Check this out from 2 Thessalonians. This is Paul writing. He says, we thank also God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it actually is, the word of God. It's a faith issue, friends. I believe in God. 
I believe that God is perfect and true, holy and right. I believe that God is a communicating God, and I believe that he has inspired the scriptures. Therefore, because of my trust and confidence and faith in him, I believe the scriptures that he has given to me are true and authoritative and qualitatively different than anything else. It's a faith issue. Secondly, it's a rational issue. This is huge. I'm just going to quickly summarize it, but it's related. Have, have you ever studied the science of the text of the scriptures? It's pretty fun. You can get lost in it. It's amazing, right? You can get into the amount of copies that exist from the time of, uh, you know, the giving of the letter to the printing press. Thousands. You could talk about the date uh, of of the earliest copy that we have to the originals within a couple decades. You could talk about the internal accuracy between thousands of copies over 1,500 years. I mean, clearly, God was at work preserving something. He was preserving his written word. Why? Because he wanted to stand the test. There's something qualitatively different And it speaks to the design of the word, the scriptures. Finally, it's a practical issue. Let's say I disagree with the statement I'm making up there, that the scriptures are God's final authority. Right? Well, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have this sort of built-in idea that there's going to be other things, too. Maybe there's going to be equal authorities. Maybe that authority is by people that are saying that they speak for God right now. Maybe that authority is going to be other councils, or maybe that authority is going to be church structures, and all these things. If I have a problem with that, then I'm, by natural, I'm going to sort of put some other things in. Yeah, there's all these innovations, but that's okay, because we should still seek a new word. There's a lot of Christians that think that. What's that going to do? We'll play that out, game it out a little bit. History shows us, <laughs> right? Ultimately, I am going to seek other authorities outside of the word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something over the word. It might be myself. It might be some other pastor. It might be some bishop or a clerical hierarchy, whatever. I'm going to put something over it. But what's going to happen is that I'm setting myself up to allow for something that is fallible. I'm setting myself up to accept and receive something from someone that can err and has many times. I'm setting myself up to receive something that can shift by culture and has many times. Or it's setting up to something to hear something from someone that is shifting by emotion or shifting by politics, <laughs> right? I'm saying you can have the ultimate say, yes, the word says this, but ultimately, what do you say about it? And if I can get a different teaching, maybe that's a little bit different from the word, that sort of suits my lifestyle or maybe elevates me to be kind of the main character in my story, or maybe puts me into that driver's seat, I'm on board. That's pretty awesome. I like that. Friends, if I allow the door to be open that the written word of God is not enough, I will embark on a steady diet. I'm always going to need more and more revelation. I'm never going to be satisfied. Oh, come on, Annie. Aren't you kind of overreacting here a little bit? It seems like that doesn't have to happen. Just look at history. <laughs> that's all that's happened. That's happened every single time. So it seems to me, just me, my humble opinion, that allowing the written word to stand as God's final authority is kind of wise. It's prudent. And it sets the foundation for my life so that my foundation then will not point me to myself and what I think and my opinions. It will not point me to culture. It will not point me to someone else, but it will point me always to the person who has been given, and that is Christ, and who has verified the word for us. And sometimes that's going to step on my toes. Sometimes I'm not going to like it. But you know what? Who cares? It doesn't matter, because it's the word of the king. And the word of the king stands. And guess what, friends? Our king has not been silent. Our king has not been silent. This is a king who is good. This is a king who is merciful. This is a king who is gracious. This is a king who is loving. This is a king who is infinitely wise. This is a king who knows me and who knows you. This is a king who knows best for you. This is a king who knew my sin and your sin, and yet he still loved me and he still loved you. This is the king that died for you and died for me. This is the king that knows all about my compromise. 
and all about your compromise and all of my idolatry and all of your idolatry. And yet he still said, I'm going to rescue them. This is the king who actually knows how to help me live. This is the king who knows how to help me grow and to be nourished in this faith until eternity. Yeah, friends, his word is enough. His word is enough. His word is life-giving. His word gives us Jesus. And whenever we are tempted to look anywhere else, stand on the word, friends. It is only wise and prudent. May, the, may our hearts then, may we approach the word of God, the word of life in our own personal time, here together, anywhere. May we approach those scriptures as the very word of life and be ever just content to say, God, you have spoken. Let me hear, let me receive. We'll take a few moments just of private time between you and the Lord, confession of sin, and we'll join together in a moment. Pray, let's pray of confession together. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all of our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word. To the end, that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, thank you for the word that is given to us to correct, to rebuke, to train us in righteousness, that we may be adequately equipped for every good work, not a few, but every good work. Lord, thank you that you are a communicating God that has given us everything we need to know for salvation and life. And that your word is true and life-giving and life-producing. Father, it is easy for us to forget that. Our nature is not content with that. Lord, we, even in our heart of hearts, we, we, we want more. We think we need more. Father, all around us are people claiming to speak truth and claiming to speak for God, for you. Lord, I pray that we would be satisfied with your word. And in that word, you would do the work you have called it to do. So Lord, forgive us where we have compromised on this. Forgive us where we have fallen into the teachings of Jezebel, maybe compromised in our own lives throughout the week, maybe mixing our faith with something else. Forgive us for minimizing our sin, for not really caring. Help us remember, Lord, that you are the one with eyes of flaming fire and that you hate our sin. But Lord, the hatred of your sin motivated you to go to the cross for us. So thank you, Father, that you took our sin on that cross despite all of our idolatry and ugliness that we might have forgiveness in life and and, and, and eternity. So, Lord, for each one here today, may we rest in that message of the gospel. And, Father, may you help us to see clearly through all all the claims and all the new teachings and all the secret revelations of our hearts or from somewhere else and help us just with joy to constantly go back to the very word that gives life, confident with certainty that it is from you. Give us that passion even in our own private devotions and as we gather together. We pray this in your name.